So tonight we're continuing the series on the spiritual gifts. Specifically tonight, we're talking about the miraculous gifts. Last week we talked about the uh, so-called redemptive or um, on the so-called redemptive gifts mm. and from Romans 12, which are the things like, they're more like characteristic things like <clears throat> like mercy and generosity. Whereas miraculous mm. gifts are a little bit more out there. Like they're a little less, less the kind of things that you can learn to do and they're more the kinds of things that God has to do. Mm -hmm. So we'll start off by reading a couple chapters out of 1 Corinthians here where Paul talks about this and then we'll delve 12. into it a little bit. 12 and 13, yeah. So, now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God work, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one, just as he determines. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I, do not, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, these parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church... God has appointed, first of all, the apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with, with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. 
if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, love, and, sorry, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. That's a really good chapter. I love that chapter. So, there's a lot to talk about pertaining to the miraculous gifts, and specifically in this. And there's a lot that we'll kind of get into as far as, you know, a placement. And as we've kind of been going through the different spiritual gifts, we've talked at, at length about how, you know, the gifts themselves do not define the person. When Paul goes up and talks about love, there's an important thing there to realize about love and about the importance of it. Because so many people can get really caught up in the all the miraculous and crazy things that God can do. I've met people firsthand who were incredibly gifted people. I, I remember a healer, I've met a ton of prophets. This healer would go around and pray for people and they'd be healed of blindness, healed of injured backs, injured or injured legs. There was a broken leg that healed it in one shot. He prayed for them, their broken leg was healed, they were dancing just a matter of minutes later. But he didn't really have any love for people. He was really caught up in like the, the grandeur of what was happening, how exciting it was. So when it came down to being more than just a, something else, or rather when it came down to being an actual vessel by which you know the Holy Spirit could not only manifest itself, but also bring relationship and more, he couldn't really do that because he didn't care about the people. He cared about what was happening. In the same vein, these prophets that I've known, you know, they care about what God's saying to them. And they'll, you know, they'll pray for a moment and tell you all the deepest, darkest secrets of who you are. Just because it's something that God will reveal to them. And they'll give you words about that God gives them to relay. And I can think of a couple off the top of my head who were just consistent about that. God would share things for them, and they would just blow people's socks off. Unfortunately, they didn't care about the people as much as they cared about the words that they were given. For instance, so basically they, it was just like, oh, I'm sharing this thing with you. You need to listen to me because I'm right about this. And when it came down to the struggles of the people, getting past the wounds that they had or the, the different parts of it, these prophets didn't have love for the people. All they had was pride in what they had heard. So as a result of that, they struggled to be more than just a resounding gong. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the dangerous ground that we find with understanding who we are. We talked about identity, I haven't posted the video yet, but, you know, we spent a, a night talking about the identity of us as Christians and about how it's not even about the offices, it's really just about you know, we talked about the offices and they're just a portion of who we are. 
but who we are at the end of the day are brothers and sisters and children of God. And there's something very important for us to take away and hold on to with that. Because the thing about the, the miraculous gifts is that they're amazing to see firsthand. They're amazing to experience. Like when Paul goes down the list, um, I there is not a single one of those that I have not personally experienced doing for other people. Whether it was words of knowledge, words of wisdom, healing, speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues, it's been all over the place. But the thing of it is, is that oftentimes we can glorify these miraculous gifts into something that they're not. Just like when we talked about the other gifts, just like gifts in general, we can build them into a thing where we start glorifying ourselves based off of what we do as opposed to who we are. We have to understand that gifts are not given because we've earned them by doing good things. Gifts are given because God just chooses to give them to you. And as such, it's not a gift because that's given because you have some right to it. It's given because he loves you. And that's it. It ends right there. They don't get taken away. They don't get they might get diminished, but they don't get taken away. And it's something for us to live with and to carry because it's something that he's given us. I can think of one prophet specifically who received the gift of prophecy and he turned his back on God entirely, left the church, started living for himself. He was like a, I think he, he was basically like a male dominatrix for a period of time. And yet during the course of all of that, God would still give him words for people. He still had the gift of prophecy. Mm -hmm. Didn't happen very often, mind you, but <laughs> it was still there. Do you believe like God can give someone a, a spiritual gift for like a moment and then like they never have it again? So we'll talk about that a little bit further here with these miraculous gifts okay. because there is a thing here with that. Yeah. So, but the first thing to talk about is this love thing and mm -hmm. about how we need to not like create an idol of these things. And there's a re big reason why Paul talks about that, even beyond the identity piece. But, as it were, <clears throat> as it were, there's another part of this, and it is specifically what you're talking about. See, the thing of it is about the miraculous gifts and why they're very diff why why we do make a, a distinguish why we distinguish them from the redemptive or motivational gifts, whatever you want to call them. See, the thing of it is, is when Paul like wrote these letters, he didn't he wasn't thinking to himself, oh, there are different types of gifts. Again, this is like a convention of uh, biblical scholars more than anybody else. But there is an important thing to it that they're kind of highlighting when we do this. Because if the, the redemptive gifts that we talked about last week, they're more like character things, things that God does inside of you, they tra where he transforms parts of who you are in your soul. Whereas the miraculous gifts are not quite so. See, when you're given the gift of healing, for example, it's not a character trait. It doesn't, it's not like mercy, where you suddenly have this, get, this deep compassion where you can see people for who they really are and really love them for who they are, seeing that they're children of God and being able to show that kind of mercy on them for the things that they've done where you don't judge them harshly or condemn mm -hmm. them for their, their failings. Mm -hmm. Now, the gift of healing is that you receive this gift and sometimes you'll get a sense or a feeling and you'll lay a hand on somebody and got, the Holy Spirit will move through you to cause that whatever's going on to heal. See, the thing of it is, the difference is that, well, the redemptive gifts are more changes inside of you that come out. A lot of like, the miraculous gifts are more along the lines of things that God does through you. 
effectively where you become a vessel for him to move in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And to answer your question, that's where it becomes a thing where sometimes you don't actually receive the gift of healing per se or gift of prophecy or whatever. Sometimes God, the Holy Spirit, will simply do a thing and you end up being the, the person by which he does that. Mm -hmm. However, there are other times where it becomes a thing where you are gifted in this. And it's like he'll bring you back to it over and over and over again. Yeah, like my, my mom, like, she told me one time she spoke in tongues um, when she received um, Christ in her life. But it was like the only time ever in her life that she's done that. So Yeah. yeah. And like for myself, like the uh, gift of healing, I don't really have that. Um, yeah, me either. I've, I've prayed for people. I've laid a hand on them, like felt the whole thing where it's like, you know the hand warms up and you feel this like you you're supposed to put a hand in this specific place and pray and then suddenly like i prayed for two guys one of them had a hurt knee and the other one had a hurt shoulder and i had no idea and i just felt like i was supposed to put a hand on each mm. and pray for healing and then both of them came up afterwards and were telling me hey did you know that my shoulder hurt and then you put your hand on it and it healed Mm. And it's like, oh yeah, cool. I have the gift of healing, and then I've never had it yeah. experience again. <laughs> yeah. So, I was mistaken to believe that. Mm. On the other hand, did they ask you to pray for them? Nope. Oh. No. Nope. Oh. There was uh -huh. nothing. It was just a quiet prayer time, and everyone was praying I for each other. I feel like that's like an issue a lot of people have. Like they they have that one experience, and then they think they're always going to have it, and they don't always, and so they they like take advantage of it basically, or yeah, they oh. misuse it. So yeah. Yeah, it's definitely important to know. Yeah, and that that is it's important to know. It's also important to to be willing to like go out ahead and experiment with that. And it's also important to not judge people for that. Yeah, like one thing to talk about right now uh, as it pertains to the miraculous gifts. You know, the one of the big things with them is that you know in a lot of like church settings. The miraculous gifts are probably like one of the more controversial elements of the Bible. You know, like the first night that we did this, or we started this series, we talked about kind of the controversy and about cessationist doctrine, and about how they'll even use the 1 Corinthians 13 verse as an explanation for why they don't, these gifts don't exist anymore. Oh yeah, like my friend I was telling you about that believes that too, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, they'll quote that, but then, you know, if you read a few lines down, Paul's talking about how everyone should be praying for prophecy. Mm. It's the entire next chapter. It's just like, you have to, you have to pretty much cherry pick that in order to believe that. Mm. And the thing with it is, is that, you know, a lot of the church, because of those kinds of judgments, it makes it very, very hard for people to experience these things. Number one, because belief is a big deal which we'll talk about after we take our little break thing, because that's the a big chunk of tonight. Um, but the other part is that a lot of people feel uncomfortable stepping out because they're worried that they're going to be judged. They're worried that they're going to be made to look like a fool. They're worried that they're going to be humiliated in front of people. Like, I'm going to go, I feel like I'm supposed to give this word thing, and... So I go do that, and I don't know what's going to happen. And then, you know, I get it wrong, and somebody's going to, like, suddenly I'm going to be lambasted, I'm going to be labeled as a false prophet, and yeah. no one's ever going to listen to me about anything again. That's a significant problem that happens in the church, and there's a place for us to need to be a little bit more open to people getting it wrong sometimes. Because the miraculous stuff, there is a development thing that needs to happen where, you know, for those people, when we talk about all these different things, where it's like, you know, speaking prophecies, words of knowledge, messages of wisdom, these kinds of things, we need to be able to provide people the opportunity to really learn when they're feeling God's presence, what is from the Spirit and what is not from the Spirit. Because one of the things that does happen with these miraculous gifts is sometimes we get really caught up in the moment. You know, like I talked about that friend who was very just excited about things. Well, sometimes his excitability led him to go.
go pray for people that he wasn't supposed to pray for. Mm -hmm. And like, like I remember distinctly- There's a time and place for everything. <laughs> exactly. And there's a place to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and his actual movement, as opposed to your own excitement mm -hmm. or your own desire. Sometimes if we're honest about it, you know, sometimes there, we find ourselves in occasions where we want to, we want to have the, our gifts work on our time. And with the miraculous gifts, you know, going back to that specific point about how this is God moving through you, you're just the vessel, so you don't control this in any way, shape, or form. I can't go to God and say, hey, I want to prophesy over Kevin, give me words for him. That doesn't work, because God's not going to do it. Um, if he does, you know, that's one thing, but... It's up to his discretion. He doesn't usually do it through that way. <laughs> yeah, if I tell him to do it, he's probably not going to do it. Um, My five-year-old tries to tell me to do a lot. Like, yeah. 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 I imagine God sees it the same way. I bet you're right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I remember there's a verse where, you know, in the Gospels, where the Pharisees came up to Jesus and were just de and were demanding that he show them a sign. And he was just like, I'll show you the sign of Jonah. And then he run, he walked away. Um, which I always thought was really funny. <clears throat> but that was the point, was that, like, you know, when you go to God demanding things, he's he doesn't have to listen to you. You say call the thunder, but what does green turn into things? What was that? You say call the ground into green, but what does green turn into things? When we demand things from God. So if you go up, and you tell God that you want, you know, that you want to heal Josh's tiredness and that he needs to, and he needs to, <laughs> and that God needs to let you do that, you're probably just going to end up touching him and praying for him and nothing's going to happen. He's still going to be tired. Because at the end of the day, what it is, is that these gifts, they're not illustrations of the transformation in us per se but what they are is they are an illustration of the holy spirit moving through you and the thing of it the other side of the thing of this is that when it comes to the miraculous we don't need to have that gift for god to do that sometimes he'll just do it sometimes you won't know he's going to do it sometimes he's just going to move one of the most obscure um experiences that people run into is when God will use people in their lives without those people even being aware. Mm -hmm. So to give an example um, of that, uh, my, my wife, Heather, you know, she's been seeing this counselor. Now, as far as we understand it, he is not a Christian in any way, shape, or form. However, you know, leading up to one of our meetings with him, God was talking about these specific things about, you know, our personal criticisms that we have and how we need to get past those. And talking about a couple of other things that I don't remember off the top of my head. But the thing that happened was he gave me this word for her right before the meth we went to go see him because she was a little worried about it. And the word was simply just go with the flow. So we went there, and sure enough, what he found himself talking about was all of the things that God had prepared her to hear about. Again, this isn't somebody that believes in God. This isn't somebody who ha necessarily has anything to do with God. And yet, the feeling of the Holy Spirit in the room was palpable. And there was a thing where he was, this man, without knowing it, was being led to share things. He would just get a, a feeling like he needed to talk about something, and then he would talk about it and address things that God had been addressing and be able to provide insights and understandings into how to manage this. See, the thing of it is, is that with God, he can just do things as he pleases here. And sometimes, like a lot of people, we don't understand this a lot of the time, but a lot of people are more open than they realize. And sadly, that can be an openness to either the enemy or to God. But it's still open. And that's a lot of like why we even receive the eyes and the ears. 
and also why we need the opportunity to be able to grow and develop in these kinds of things. Because the miraculous is weird. And the bottom line of it is, is that when we talk about the miraculous gifts, these are things that God's doing through us. It's not necessarily that he's transforming our hearts to do them, it's that he's doing them and he's giving us the impression or the intuition or whatever to where we know that we need to go do this thing. So when we go and do this thing, we need the opportunity to learn what's God and what's not. And an atmosphere where we can learn what's God and what's not. Because as we come from the world, and as we come from this nature where a lot of our a lot more of how we live and do is dictated by how we feel or think and we're very much so creatures that are governed by our experiences our society our culture all these different things that have developed us and ingrained different impressions and pretenses into us suddenly you're dealing with the existence of another entity that's in you and leading you and taking you to places that don't actually match up with a lot of like how we perceive the world because the truth is is that for most of us coming into the church and even a lot of us who grew up in the church the idea that suddenly you're going to go walk over and you're going to say this thing about this person that you don't know you just know that you feel like you're supposed to and you have this deep pull that's yanking you in that direction and you need to go do this, and suddenly you're supposed to believe that you're supposed to share this thing, and then it's gonna like blow their whole world to pieces. And then it does, and that's just weird too. We all respond to God doing things like that as though it's impossible. That's why it's called miraculous. So there's this place for us to be able to have the opportunity to experience this, but also there's a place for us to understand that these gifts are not ours in the sense that they we don't control them, we don't make them happen, but we can very much so ask God. There's an important thing to look at here at the final part of uh, 1 Corinthians 12 where Peter, er, Paul in verse 31 says, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. A lot of people miss it because it comes at the end of him asking this question, is everyone an apostle, is everyone a prophet, is everyone a this, is everyone a that? And the point of it is, it's almost like saying, you know, can everybody do these things? No. But you should want to. See, the thing about, one of the last things that I'll say here about these, about the miraculous gifts, is that this isn't something where we shouldn't want this. In fact, this is something that we should be hungry for. In fact, with spiritual gifts in general, we should hunger for what God has for us. See, when, when we talk about like little kids, you know, parents, a lot of parents do enjoy giving their kids gifts. I don't know, ask Sierra, she's a mom. <laughs> really? I have three. Yeah, birds and myself. Yeah. People like giving gifts. It's a thing. And especially to people they care about. What? No. It is louder. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I got people talking behind me, so it's a little harder to hear. But the thing of it is, is where this whole thing about giving gifts. God likes to give gifts. And the truth is, is that most of us like to receive gifts. Like, we, we can go into, like, the five love languages, but everybody desire, but everyone likes to receive something nice once in a while. Mm -hmm. And from God, these are big things. These are big deals that he provides to us. And the truth is, a lot of us don't believe that we deserve anything. 
because we have this kind of like scalded dog mentality that's been generated by years of being tormented by people. And as a result of that, we don't feel like we deserve anything. We don't feel like we can ever go up and ask him anything of him, but that's a lie. And that's something that's been generated because of all that stuff that I mentioned earlier, where it's society, parents, family in general, and all these different things. But it's a lie that blinds us as to who God actually is and causes us to miss his character. So, when Paul says eagerly desire these things, he means it. Because there's a lot for us to learn about God in that. And who he is, what matters to him, how much he cares about us. Because you never know what he's going to actually give you. He could give you something that blows your blows your mind. And he oftentimes does. So, you know, as it comes down to these these spiritual these miraculous gifts, this is something for us to seek. I mean, who doesn't want to see God manifest in front of them in some way? To see his power move in some way. We all talk about it like so many churches believe that God can do this but nobody believes he will <laughs> so that's like the perfect catchphrase for most things actually yeah, exactly so we should seek to see him do what he will do mm -hmm. and we can oftentimes be really surprised by what he will do simply per our request I always remember um, this speaker at uh, Bridgetown when I used to go there. He was talking about prayer specifically, and he was talking about the way that we pray and how we just kind of like, you know, he spent a lot of time talking about how foolish we sound when we pray, and he went into the different kinds of prayers that people do. You know, there's the just prayer, where they, ju they say just a lot. Or father a lot. Or, or father a lot, a lot yeah. You know, What's my gosh, just it's prayer? so just 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 pray. I just I just pray. For, I just oh. pray. yeah, like yeah. That. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. No, I know people who say like God after every single like sentence. I'm like, holy crap! Like this is so distracting. I can't even focus. <laughs> yeah. But the the thing with that is, you know, he also talked about how, you know, he just had a newborn son, and he was explaining how if his <clears throat> son who's less than a year old would jump up in his crib and say dad I want a Ferrari and I want a glass of red wine his son would get those things simply because he asked for them and also because he, was he would just be that impressed to see his less than a year old son stand up and say specifically those things so <laughs> but that was the point that was the point. Like I know, the mom's over here and... squinting her eyes like... Imagine I mean, the impression would be real, but at the same time, I'd also be concerned of my parenting. Like, how do, how do you know to even ask for red wine? But imagine your kid's first word being Ferrari. Right. <laughs> but the, uh, the point was just this, that it comes down to the value of the child and how much they matter. And how sometimes it really just is because you love them that you'll give them something like that. And for a lot of us, we don't understand how much, how true that is of God. I mean, the, if we're honest about things, there are things that he gives us that are bad for us. And he gives them to us because we're asking for him, for them. I can think of a friend of mine who asked for years for a specific job. And God told him over and over and over again, you shouldn't, you don't want this job. It's bad for you. You're not going to do good at it. After years of my friend, you know, complaining about it, being mad at God about it, God finally gave him what he wanted. He was bad at the job. He was miserable while he was doing it and finally had to be moved to a different job. But the point remains that God still gave him what he wanted. Even though he warned him it wasn't going to work Did out. Did he know God told him no? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, Is yeah. that a learning moment or no? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. I feel like that that's the case a lot in uh, relationships. Yes. <laughs> a lot of people are like, I want, I want to be with her, I want to be with him. Like, 
no, like they're not for you. It's like, well, too bad. Like I want to, you know, and then they have to go through that learning, learning phase. I know, oh, yes. I, I know that was definitely the case for me. Yeah. <laughs> high fives for that. <laughs> I don't know if that happens. deserves a high five, but <laughs> it's kind of a shame five. <laughs> um. <laughs> a shame five. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Sit down, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, um, okay. So, last week when we talked about the redemptive gifts, you know, for those who weren't here, um, we. I'm not, yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 We talked about how. You know, even though this series is about spiritual gifts, you know, last week, talk, going over the redemptive gifts and what they were, it wasn't about the gifts themselves, the message, the thing that God was putting on our hearts here. Rather, it was about what lies beneath that. And the way that a lot of that came down to our perception of knowing how things are supposed to be. And there's a similar thing here when we're talking about the miraculous. See, the thing of it is, is that when we talk about the miraculous gifts, we're talking about things that are supernatural. We're talking about things that God does through his power alone. Even if you receive this gift, it's still him who does it. You're just a vessel in a lot of ways. I don't have, I, I don't command the gift of prophecy. I, I, act in it when God gives me something. It ultimately comes from his spirit. I don't control this. <clears throat> so the biggest thing that we end up having to run into is that we have to face a couple of very distinct issues that exist within us. And that is our belief in God and also God's power and our knowledge of that, and our belief in that. See, a while back during the Spiritual Warfare series, we spent some time talking about the power of God and about what that looks like. We also talked about how with the enemy, our belief in demons and in their power empowers them. There's this thing that happens where when we believe that they have certain things that they can do to us, we're open to that. Our belief in that opens the way for them to be able to affect us in these ways. It's almost like there's this thing that happens with like older and younger brothers. It's a kind of an obscure phenomenon where like the younger brother will oftentimes lose a fight to the older brother. It doesn't matter how much bigger and stronger the younger brother gets. He will still lose to the older brother because in his mind he thinks it's impossible for him to win. So he doesn't try as hard. He doesn't give what he can. Mm. In a lot of ways, he's already defeated. So even though he can easily overpower his older brother, he won't do it. I know that I've personally experienced this phenomenon with my younger brother, who is bigger and stronger than me, and even when he got bigger and stronger than me, because he was working out and I wasn't, I still beat him in a fight one time. It was hard. Right. Right. And, and that's the point, is like, we develop these kinds of things, and it's a similar thing that happens with the enemy. We believe that he can do it, so we allow him to do it, or allow them to do it. The same way that we do it with ourselves. Confidence can be an enormous thing. If I'm confident in my ability to read a room and share things pertaining to people and figure people out, usually that will help me go and deliver something if I believe in myself. This is something that we run into all the time. But it, we are subject to our belief. If we believe we're going to screw up, we're pretty liable to screw up. We'll, we'll flinch, our voices will flutter, we'll, get, we'll lose track because our anxiety rises and 
creeps into our thoughts and processes and suddenly it just doesn't work as well. And obviously neither of these things are true across the board, the psychological thing or the, uh, you know, the way that we can freak ourselves out, but it's pretty general, or pretty generally true. But the thing that we need to face with God's power is that God's power is not subject to our belief. See, God's power is sovereign. God is who he is. He has all the strength that he has. He has all the power that he has. And one of the things that we have to understand about him is this is what's true. See, there's nothing that really stops him from doing what he intends to do. If God wants to give you something, he's going to give you something. If he's going to tell you something, he's going to tell you something. If he wants to move a mountain from one place to another, he will move that mountain. God's power is not subject to our belief. A lot of us don't understand that because a lot of us are raised with these mentalities of, well, in order to really experience God, you have to believe in God. There's a truth to this, but where we take it is that we start believing in our own ability. We start believing in our lack of faith as being the thing that prevents us from really receiving what God's doing. Or better, to better put it, we believe that our lack of faith will stop God from doing things. And that's not true. So when it comes down to it, as we're spending our time worrying about our faith, we're not receiving because we're not seeing what God's doing. So the first thing that to talk about is God's power. If he wants to heal you, he will heal you. Sometimes he has to take us places or wants to take us places before he'll heal us. But his power is absolute. The other thing that we have to realize is that he's not going to step on our free will, though. See, the thing with God is his limitations are self-inflicted. It's interesting. I've never heard of it that way. See, the thing of it is, is, you know, as I just said about the, uh, sorry, I just got a verse, um, which we'll go to in a minute. The thing of it is, is like I said, he will not step on your free will. Um, there's this verse in Revelation, I believe it's 321, 320. Revelation 3, 20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. And just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The point here is that even where he tries to meet us, he will often wait for us to receive him. And see, if we understand, first off, that God's power is not dictated by our belief, our reception of him is. See, the thing of it is, is that where belief comes in and can really stifle us from receiving, from experiencing the power of God, even in these gifts, like what I was talking about earlier about how we need an atmosphere where we can be safe to screw up sometimes so we can learn how to discern between what is God and what is not. There's this thing here where we need to be able to develop our belief because as we experience those things where we experience God doing 
and moving through us, where we experience the Spirit, there's a place for us to develop belief in Him through those experiences. See, when we... When the old man is put away... What was that verse we just read? Um, as the old passes away and the new comes into existence, as we've given ourselves to God, we have to give up the old man and live in the new. And there's a big thing here that happens where we need to exist in who we are now as opposed to who we were and have been. Um, in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 3, Paul talks at length about wisdom and about the wisdom of the world. Uh, to give an example, in verse 18 of chapter 1, Paul says, or writes, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are, are being saved it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made, the fool made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of the world, or for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. The point being, and as you read through those chapters, you find that Paul talks a lot about this subject of the world's wisdom. And see, the thing of it is, is as we come to God and we give ourselves to him, we come to experience something new in terms of a new kingdom, a new existence, something that's beyond what we've come from in nature and in the world. And there's a place where we need to be open to that. And similar to last week, where a lot of our, we can have a hardened mind and a hardened heart, that hardened mind thing can become a really difficult thing to overcome, and especially in this subject, where we're looking at what God's saying he's going to do, and we're saying that can't happen, or that's not logical, that doesn't make sense, because my experiences tell me that doesn't make sense. There is a place for us to come and live in this new place where God is the one who's dictating our reality. And the crazy thing that happens is when we have God dictating our reality, when we set our belief in him as opposed to what we've experienced or what we've been taught in the past, we come to experience new things, crazy things. That's when we see the manifestation of all those gifts that we talked about. That's when the miraculous starts to become real because we're not afraid to step out and see God be God. And therein lies like the big thing is where belief comes in to distract us and destroy our faith or comes in to move us into a new place where God is more than just a story that we read. See, the thing of it is that we have to kind of hash out in and of ourselves is that our past experiences don't actually tell us who God is. Because they're from our experiences before we knew him. <laughs> the thing that we need is to be able to move into something new. Into something more and less bound by what we can perceive in this world. See, as long as we... See, the thing of it is, is no matter what, we will believe in something. See, disbelief's a funny word because while we might disbelieve God, we replace that by believing in our five senses or by believing in our experiences or by believing in the pains that we've suffered in the past. 
And see, one of the big things here is like, we sit in this odd tension of holding on to our pasts, holding on to our experiences, holding on to all these different things that have told us this is true. And yet when God says there's a new way, we will turn on that, on believing in him in order to hold on to those because they've been so real. But in, but in contrast, what that does is that actually stops us from being able to experience that new thing that God has for us. Because we either believe that he has the power to do that or we don't. So when we hear about these miraculous gifts of like speaking in tongues where the spirit will move and suddenly you're speaking in another language and ministering to somebody who doesn't speak your language and you don't know what you're saying but you know that they're getting it <clears throat> and they walk away as a believer that's something that can as I can tell you has happened mm -hmm. I mean if you want a biblical example it's an acts if you want a real example there was a friend of mine in Bible college who didn't speak Spanish and ended up ministering to a guy who did speak only Spanish because God spoke to him through tongues I, yeah I've heard stories I've, I've heard of examples like that too that happening yeah. and see the thing of it is, is that belief will dictate whether or not we experience that for ourselves those miraculous and wild things or it will dictate that we continue to experience the reality that we have them. Because see, where we set our belief is where we will sit. And God won't push us, he won't force us. He might send people, he might do things, but at the end of the day, even when he shows up, I have one friend in particular who I can think of who God has shown up to over and over and over again. God has given this person visions. He's done miraculous things that, you know, from turning on to shut up devices to just appearing to him in different ways. And yet this friend still prefers to hold on to his old system of belief. Like God has manifested his power in front of this friend so many times over, and yet this friend still sits in the same place of disbelief. Hmm? Yeah. I have the touch of scars. <laughs> Sorry. Thomas, yeah. Thomas. I get those mixed up. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I was so confused. I'm like, what? what? Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. Timothy, he has great faith. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's fine. I do the same thing with Elijah. Yeah. Elisha. Yeah, <laughs> Elijah and Elisha, yeah. David and Daniel. <laughs> yeah. But the, the point of it is that God has shown his power to this person and yet this person still does not believe and the truth is is that where it comes down to is we've talked about comfort zones in the past and it's a big deal for tonight because comfort zones are an interesting subject comfort we use the word comfort which to a lot of us when we hear that word it implies the idea that this is a place where we feel safe where we feel you know, where we can enjoy, we can feel comfortable here. But the truth of comfort zones is not that. Comfort zones are places where your mind sits and has ease. And the thing about the mind and being at ease is that the mind can be at ease in really terrible places. The thing, of, the thing that we run into all the time as believers but specifically as believers in Jesus who have come from an existence in this world and are developed by experiences in this world is that we can easily use that experience to stand up and say, well, I don't believe in you because of this and that creates our comfort zone because we're more comfortable with what we've experienced and we feel safer responding to what we've experienced. <laughs> yes. That's the word I was thinking of too. It's not comfort we crave, it's familiarity. Yes. 
See, comfort is a thing. Even to bring up, since you guys both bring up the word familiarity, it just brings back to mind the subject of familiar spirits, which are, when we talked about spiritual warfare, we talked about demons who are assigned to a person or a family. And they revolve around that family and create an atmosphere that is familiar to the individuals involved. And that familiar atmosphere is not necessarily a good atmosphere because it can be an atmosphere of anxiety, of fear, of depression, despair, rage, savagery, cruelty, lies, deceit of any kind, manipulation, hatred. See, they create these atmospheres where we can feel comfortable because it's familiar to us. It's bad. It in no way exhibits any part of what it is to live in God's kingdom. But because it's familiar, we feel comfortable enough to stay there. Because it feels safe, it feels normal to us. And normal isn't always healthy. Either. Exactly. In fact, it often isn't yeah. our version of healthy. Yeah. And that's the point, is that that old normal will oftentimes be the thing that stops us from experiencing God. New things in God. Um, the last verse that I was given to go over here is in 1 John 4. And there are two different parts uh, and mind you this verse was given to Heather when we were praying or when she was praying about the message so it was a thing but the first part is dear friends do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the, in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God, and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. And see, there's a certain challenge here in this, in this chunk of verse, you know, to test the kinds of spirits around us. And that is to say, even the atmospheres that we find ourselves feeling comfortable in, or where things feel normal. Because if what you're experiencing in your normality is destructive, or hurtful, that's not something that God's put you in. On the contrary, oftentimes when we've been there for a long enough time, we can come to find out that in fact God tried really hard to tell us not to go there. Like we were talking about earlier with those relationships, mm -hmm. where he spoke and said, don't do that. And then we wanted it, and we got it, and then it was bad. Or jobs, or living situations, or any number of different things. Even beyond that, there's a thing for us to lean into him and find out from him, you know, what's real and what's not here, what's good and what's not. Because there's a lot of not good that we feel comfortable in because it's familiar and normal. And there's a lot of 
and there's a lot of not good that God wants to take us away from. And he has the power to do that, but oftentimes we have to be able to grab a hold of that. See, that, that friend of mine I was talking about, God has shown him these things in order to help him understand that he's there for him. He's protected him from all kinds of things that could have gone wrong. But he still clings to what's familiar. And there's a place in our hearts where we need to let go of what's familiar in order to move on and experience something new. And the last part to read here. This can be really uncomfortable. Yes. We'll go ahead and go from verse 7 through 18, I believe. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God, sh God showed us his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him, and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him there is no fear in love but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment the one who fears is not made perfect in love so there's this thing talking about miraculous gifts and talking about even being able to receive in that regard. Because the thing of it is, is that as we talk about the miraculous, there has to be a perspective, and that perspective is that love comes first. Because if you exist in the miraculous and don't have love, you're wasting everyone's time. Especially your own. There's this thing that happens where we need to come out of a place of love and intimacy with God. And through that, where our hearts are changing and transforming, and we're moving into these new places of moving away from the old familiar and into the new familiar, and that becoming something, it's uncomfortable at first to, for any kind of change to happen. When we've lived lives that are subject to fear, how does it feel to leave a life of fear or hatred or anxiety and moving into a life of freedom, of love, of hope, and joy? Like those are not comfortable feelings for people who've never really got to have them be their normal. They can feel like they're not even real. Exactly. So there's this thing where suddenly you have to believe in something that you've never experienced or that doesn't seem real. And God's telling you it's a real thing, but that doesn't mean anything from your experience. 
to see it's in love and being loved that we really transform. And the miraculous, we go forward believing that because God loves us, he wants to give us these good gift things, these gifts, and that he'll be bend the world, space and time, and break laws of physics because he loves us that much, that he doesn't care about that stuff. He's not subject to it. And since we're his children, neither are we. That's part of his power. He knows that. And he's sovereign in that. And he'll take us to those places. For us, though, there's a place for us to step into that. When I, when I first became, when I first started becoming, like, more than just kind of a, a I don't think I was ever a nominal Christian, but, you know, there was a place before where I didn't really know the Holy Spirit. And see, the first time that God talked to me, like, in an audible voice, you know, I told him, I was just like, because uh, he, he gave me a bunch of words about what to do to f start the first group that I led. He told me who he wanted to lead it, or help lead it, and what jobs specifically he wanted them to do, who to invite. And then later, I remember having more questions, and I prayed and didn't hear anything. And the response to that was, no, no, no. You don't get to, you don't get to be quiet now. You talked to me. We had a conversation. You started this. So we get to continue in this path because this is what you chose for us. So talk to me. And he did. And the thing of it is, is in my heart, what I wanted most was to continue to communicate, to continue to step in. I didn't want to go back to living this life of just praying and seeking and, you know, having conversations with myself that were directed at him. I wanted this new normal, this new thing to live in that could be so completely beyond what I had experienced before. Because up until that point, I didn't believe, I was raised to believe that the prophetic had passed away and that God didn't really do that anymore. At the very least, he wouldn't do it with me because I, I had my own hang-ups on myself and my own image of myself. So when he did it, when he spoke to me, I wanted him to speak more. And there was something to grab onto, and I did. And the reason why I go into that and talk about that is what I'm told to, and two, because there's something to glean from that, where for each of us, we need to really think about what we want. If we want to hold on to the old, or if we want something new. Because at the end of the day, this series about spiritual gifts is not intended to be one where we walk away from it being who we were when we started it. But instead, there's more. There's more to hear and more to receive and more that God's going to try to lead us into. And in this particular subject, talking about his power and acknowledging what it is, but also acknowledging that he's not going to breach our free will. He's going to let us have what we want here. So when we pray, we'll pray for hearts that want more, or we'll pray for places where we can believe in a new normal, where we can move past the familiar and into something real with God a new familiar, uncomfortable as it may be, something new and beautiful and healthy in actuality. So aside from the praying, that's what I got. <laughs>